Hello, everyone at St. Clair. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Matthew Flynn. I'm the Director of Adult Faith Formation and Mission at St. Clair. Um, I'm presenting to you today from um, my home office, I guess. It's our spare bedroom. It also contains um, my puzzles that I work on. I enjoy doing puzzles, and this room has a lock, and that keeps my four-year-old and two-year-old from getting into my puzzles and um, my weightlifting set um, and um, my wife's sewing table and now that sewing table is my desk. Um, so here I am presenting to you from here. Um, it's a little strange for me to be talking into a camera and not being able to, to see all of you. Um, this talk was originally not at all part of what I was expecting for the Lent uh, speaker series. Um, but as, you know, things started getting worse with the spread of coronavirus, um, uh, my first instinct was really just to cancel the final two talks. Um, my talk on um, Holy Saturday and the Easter Vigil and Father Jim's talk on um, uh, the Easter season and its spirituality and practices. And, well, not cancel, but postpone them for a time when we could all gather again together. And I think I'll still be giving a talk at some point on the Easter Vigil, and Father Jim will be giving a talk at some point on um, the Easter season and its spirituality and practices. But um, as I was thinking about um, postponing those, I, I realized that there's a lot of um, good stuff in Holy Saturday that I was going to kind of briefly mention um, in my talk that was mostly going to focus on the Easter Vigil. And I thought, wow, there's a lot of material here that I think really kind of fits with our situation right now. Um, and so, you know, we'll hopefully get into that in my presentation in, in a couple um, minutes. But um, that's, that's where this idea of doing this presentation on um, really just Holy Saturday and the spirituality of Holy Saturday and how we can use its practices came about um, by thinking about our current situation and and seeing some parallels. So um, I hope that you'll bear with me. I'm recording this and I'm hoping that I can show you my, um, my slides as we go through this so you won't be looking at me just talking the whole time. Um, you'll basically be seeing my slides and hearing me talk. Um, so hoping that works. And um, since this is being recorded, um, I obviously won't be able to take questions, but if you have any questions, um, you can find my email address on the parish website under um, contacts, and you can email me anything that you are um, confused or curious about or want to learn more about. I'd be happy to take those, and if you give me a phone number to call you at, um, I'll even call you in person and, and talk about your question, which might be more than you are asking for, so you don't have to leave me your phone number, but you're, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, so I'm going to pull up my slides and, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get started here. So thank you for, for watching this. All right. So here we are, um, talking about the spirituality of Holy Saturday. And, um, before I even get into the presentation, you'll notice that a lot of the backgrounds and pictures I'm using in our slides are, um, from our church. And that was an intentional decision. Um, I'm not gonna, um, hide from, um, <laughs> Um, explaining that. The, the reason was, as I was walking to the church um, in the days before shelter in place was, was passed down, um, you know, there, there was hardly anyone coming to the church. We'd already had, um, you know, public mass had been um, forbidden by the bishop for the time being, and, um, you know, we were down to that only 10 people can gather in a place and our um, baptismal font had to be emptied of water so that, you know, people couldn't spread germs through, through the font. And so I, I took some pictures because the empty font just spoke to me about our situation. Um, I've always loved our font and its beauty and its symbolism. And um, the fact that it was empty, um, spoke to me on a couple levels. One, it didn't have the water that I was so used to signing myself with and, and doing the, the sign of the cross with. And two, um, which 
is sort of a, a reverse image because when it's full, we, we think that it has, you know, the, the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in it, through, you know, the holy water that um, we use to remind ourselves of our baptism, but that we actually use as well when we, when we do the full immersion baptisms and, and, you know, generally, I've seen a couple infants be fully immersed, but mostly we, we pour the water on, on the infant's heads when we baptize. But seeing that water gone really struck me. Um, and it spoke to me of the sense of the tomb that we really have, this emptiness of being in the tomb, which is, um, you know, Holy Saturday, um, being at the tomb. Um, you know, Christ is in the tomb. Our, our spirituality is, is that of kind of being at the tomb um, and being in the tomb. We'll talk about that a little bit um, as well. Um, and that that emptiness, like I said, spoke to me on that that level of um, Christ's presence or not presence, and then just sort of oddly, it's an empty tomb now. Um, it was a full tomb with the water, but the water of life, and now it's sort of an empty tomb. Um, so I'm I'm not really sure what to do with that kind of reverse symbolism of it's empty, but normally it's full. But the emptiness that we talk about is you know, the emptiness of the, the resurrection, that the tomb is empty and Christ has risen. So um, be that as it may, um, you're going to see a lot of pictures of the baptismal font and, and some other things in our church. And the other reason I took the pictures was I just figured that people would miss our church. It's a beautiful church. Um, so I took these pictures um, the day of or, or the day before shelter in place was put put in place, but having the sense that I would need them, and um, I did end up needing them, and <laughs> here they are. So, um, the spirituality of Holy Saturday, being at the tomb. So, when we talk about Holy Saturday, the actual day, I think we we kind of gloss over it. It's just that period where Jesus is in the tomb, but between the Passion and the Resurrection, it's sort of empty, empty time or empty space. It was the Jewish Sabbath. Nothing really happened. Um, you know, people went home, said they were in a rush to um, get Jesus buried um, before the Sabbath. Um, so, you know, they, they put him in the tomb and um, they didn't even get him properly embalmed because it said, you know, they were coming back with the spices and things to, to um, you know, tend to him um, on Easter Sunday. They were coming with, with all those things um, to better prepare his body and, and complete burial. Um, and so we, we sort of skip over that because in the Bible, nothing really happens. Um, but our creed, the Nicene Creed doesn't say a whole lot more about it, except he suffered death and was buried. Um, we're used to saying all of this, you know, every, every Sunday. Um, and then he rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. The Apostles' Creed says a, a little bit more. It says he was buried and he descended into hell. And then on the third day, he rose again from the dead. Um, so Holy Saturday, we can think about as not really spiritual warfare, like Jesus and, and Satan doing battle, like with swords or, or anything. Um, it wasn't that, that kind of battle. Um, it, it was definitive. Christ, Christ had won. Satan didn't have any, any power. Um, but he descended into hell. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in this presentation. But it gives us a sense of Holy Saturdays more than just like waiting time. Um, Christ was unleashing his power, um, the power of the resurrection, um, breaking into hell um, and breaking um, the sort of saints of the Old Testament, so to speak, out. Um, sort of this beautiful image, and I've got uh, some material for us to look at in just a minute. Before we go into that, though, I want to highlight what we have from the Roman Missal, which you may or may not know is the, the big red book for Mass. Um, so the servers bring it and hold it for Father Jim to pray out of. Um, it is put on the altar when um, Father Jim saying the Eucharistic prayers. Um, it's the big red book, but it, it tells us how to say Mass, basically, and the rules. And there are these rules in it for Holy Saturday. Um, but the interesting thing is there's less than one page for Holy Saturday. 
Um, in fact, it's only three sentences that we have for Holy Saturday and what we're supposed to do. Um, and they're, they're not like liturgical instructions that only apply to the priest. Um, like, you know, you should put a cloth here or, you know, raise your hands in this way when you're saying this prayer. They're instructions for the whole church. Um, and this is kind of where I got my idea from for this presentation was that there's some remarkable similarities to our present situation right now. So here, here it is, a, a picture of the three sentences. On Holy Saturday, the church waits at the Lord's tomb in prayer and fasting, meditating on his passion and death and on his descent into hell and awaiting his resurrection. Um, certainly think we're, we're kind of waiting at the tomb in prayer and hopefully fasting um, right now. And some people are certainly meditating, maybe too much so on, on death and maybe not so much in, in the presence of Christ's passion and understanding his resurrection. The church abstains from the sacrifice of the mass. We're certainly doing that right now, um, at least in, in a sense, not the sense where there is no mass being said. Um, there are still masses being said, but we're just not allowed to attend them. Um, but the sacred table left bare until after the solemn vigil, um, they mean the Easter vigil here, that is the anticipation by night of the resurrection. When the time comes for Paschal joys, the abundance of which overflows to occupy 50 days, meaning the, the Easter season. Um, but I love that line, the abundance of which overflows to occupy 50 days. Um, big party. And then um, Holy Communion may only be given on this day as viaticum, which um, is, as some people know of it, last rites, um, sort of. Um, but it, it's supposed to be kind of for the journey. Viaticum has to do with the way, the journey um, from Latin. And it's not necessarily the last time you receive the Eucharist, but it's given under the assumption that it, it very well could be the last time you receive the Eucharist before you die. Um, some people, you know, they receive it and then they, they hold out for a little longer and call the priest back or um, the deacon who may be able to, you know, even a lay person can not do the, the whole of um, the rites associated with it, like anointing of the sick, but they can administer viaticum by, by giving Eucharist. Um, you know, so you can receive it multiple times, um, but it's given with the understanding that this person is probably, this is going to be their last time. Um, and that may not be the situation everywhere right now, but certainly, again, most of us aren't receiving the Eucharist. And um, probably the, the preference right now and the priority is really just giving, getting it to, to those who really need it, um, because they, they may very well not be around much longer. Now, in my book on, on Holy Saturday here, which is... Um, it's not the actual Roman Missal, it's a daily Missal, um, which is used for praying with the Mass and all of that. So the quote from the Catechism here isn't in the Roman Missal, but it's in here for devotional purposes. And I think it's a very helpful quote that the people who organized this um, pulled out from the Catechism. Baptism, the original and full sign of which is immersion, efficaciously signifies the descent into the tomb by the Christian who dies to sin with Christ in order to live a new life. And then this is a quote from St. Paul. Uh, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Um, so again, I, I talk about being at the tomb more than being in the tomb. Um, because we're only really in the tomb when we're, when we're being baptized. Um, <laughs> then we're out of it. Um, we're, we're into this new life. Um, so um, that was the, the reason I, I chose being at the tomb. First, I actually had it in top of being in the tomb, and then I thought, well, that's not really quite accurate. Um, so this is um, going to be a, a bit of a read. Um, bear with me. Um, but this is about Holy Saturday. This is from an ancient homily for Holy Saturday. And some of you at least know that the church is very good about keeping records. Um, 
So normally when someone writes something significant in the history of the church, we know who wrote it. Um, we don't know who wrote this. Um, in the Liturgy of the Hours, this is um, one of the, the readings um, for the Office of Readings for Holy Saturday. Um, and it doesn't provide an author. It doesn't say, you know, St. Augustine or St. John Chrysostom or, you know, Sometimes we have a reading from the saint of the day or someone who wrote about the saint of the day, um, things like that. It, it doesn't say who wrote this. It just says from an ancient homily for Holy Saturday. Um, but it, it gives us a sense of what is going on for Jesus on Holy Saturday. Um, and ever since I read it the first time, I've been in love with this passage. Um, and so I, I hope you will bear with me and um, let me read it to you. I'll put the words up here for you to see. Something strange is happening. There is a great silence on earth today, a great silence and stillness. The whole earth keeps silence because the king is asleep. The earth trembled and is still because God has fallen asleep in the flesh and he has raised up all who have slept ever since the world began. God has died in the flesh, and hell trembles with fear. He has gone to search for our first parent as for a lost sheep, greatly desiring to visit those who live in darkness and in the shadow of death. He has gone to free from sorrow the captives Adam and Eve, he who is both God and the son of Eve. The Lord approached them, bearing the cross, the weapon that had won him the victory. At the sight of him, Adam, the first man he had created, struck his breast in terror and cried out to everyone, My Lord be with you all. Christ answered him, And with your spirit. He took him by the hand and raised him up, saying, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. I am your God, who for your sake have become your son. Out of love for you and for your descendants, I now by my own authority command all who are held in bondage to come forth, all who are in darkness to be enlightened, all who are sleeping to arise. I order you, O sleeper, to awake. I did not create you to be held a prisoner in hell. Rise from the dead, for I am the life of the dead. Rise up, work of my hands, you who were created in my image. Rise, let us leave this place, for you are in me and I am in you. Together we form only one person, and we cannot be separated. For your sake, I, your God, became your son. I, the Lord, took the form of a slave. I, whose home is above the heavens, descended to the earth and beneath the earth. For your sake, for the sake of man, I became like a man without help, free among the dead. For the sake of you who left a garden, I was betrayed to the Jews in a garden, and I was crucified in a garden. See on my face the spittle I received in order to restore to you the life I once breathed into you. See there the marks of the blows I received in order to refashion your warped nature in my image. On my back, see the marks of the scourging I endured to remove the burden of sin that weighs upon your back. See my hands nailed firmly to a tree for you who once wickedly stretched out your hand to a tree. I slept on the cross and a sword pierced my side for you who slept in paradise and brought forth Eve from your side. My side has healed the pain in yours. My sleep will rouse you from your sleep in hell. The sword that pierced me has sheathed the sword that was turned against you. Rise, let us leave this place. The enemy led you out of the earthly paradise. I will not restore you to that paradise, but I will enthrone you in heaven. 
I forbade you the tree that was only a symbol of life. But see, I who am life itself am now one with you. I appointed cherubim to guard you as slaves are guarded. But now I make them worship you as God. The throne formed by cherubim awaits you, its bearers swift and eager. The bridal chamber is adorned, the banquet is ready, the eternal dwelling places are prepared, the treasure houses of all good things lie open. The kingdom of heaven has been prepared for you from all eternity. And then this is a quote from the Exultet or the Easter Proclamation. This is the night when Christ broke the prison bars of death and rose victorious from the underworld. So Holy Saturday is not just a day of waiting around. It's not just a day of relaxing or kicking back or getting ready for a big Easter party. Um, it's a day for reflection and appreciation of Christ freeing us from the power of death, Christ breaking forth from the prison of hell and leading all those in the underworld who, who we now consider, you know, the saints of the Old Testament and who knows how many else besides who, you know, um, have been able to um, live in the goodness of salvation that, that Christ offers us now in heaven. Um, I was once talking to someone trying to convey this um, breaking the prison bars of death analogy. Um, and the image I used was imagine trying to contain a nuclear bomb in a prison. Um, all that energy, all that power, um, Christ, who is the source of life, God, the creator, um, who exists of his own. Um, God just exists necessarily, which is this mind-blowing concept. How can that be subject to death? Um, it, it would be like, you know, we, we think of death as this strong thing, like, you know, steel bars. But when you compare it to the power of a, a nuclear weapon, not only would they be like blown apart, they would be vaporized, just gone. Um, there would be no prison left. Um, that's a rough analogy of the power that Christ has. Um, and um, I just, I love that image so much that Christ going and, and meeting our first parents, Adam and Eve, and addressing them with all of this reassurance of, yeah, you screwed up, but here I fixed it all. And not only that, but here, come, come and live with me, come and dwell with me. Um, these beautiful allusions to, to scripture, to the banquet and the the treasure house and the, the rooms um, that are, are prepared for us, um, these lavish images that Christ uses in his parables and, you know, that we find in the Gospels. So um, that's um, kind of my, if, if you don't have a basis for Holy Saturday um, and what what our spirituality is, what our, our basis is for what's going on on Holy Saturday. That's what's going on. So hopefully that helps contextualize everything else I say in this presentation. Because if we don't get that about Holy Saturday, then I don't think we, we get how as Christians being at the tomb is different for us. So again, you know, um, Christ has broken the prison bars of death. Um, we're not confined to the tomb. We're not. We're, we're already broken out. Um, however, um, in this situation, we, we might still feel like we are in it. Literally, um, we're, we're kind of, some of us are actually quarantined, um, and um, there are parishioners of ours who are quarantined. Um, 
not everyone may, maybe knows that, but um, there are. We, we have some parishioners who are quarantined. Um, right now, they're, as far as I know, they're all on precautionary basis. Um, no one's tested positive, but there are people who have been told, don't leave your house. Um, so they may, may literally feel like they're in a tomb. You know, some of us can at least get out a little bit. Um, you know, I go jogging, take the kids for a walk. Um, you know, but mostly, yeah, we're, we're kind of confined to a place. Um, and then just this sense of everything kind of going wrong around us, being dislocated in a sense from, from our normal routine, we may feel like we're also in a tomb. We're not in control. We don't know how this will end. Um, just a, a lack of security for, for us. Um, so that may also feel like we're in a tomb. And some people may be experiencing real deaths. Um, quite literally, maybe some of us know people who, who are dying from coronavirus or um, dying for other reasons, but we can't even go to their funerals. Um, you know, we'll have to wait for a memorial service later or something like that. Um, and then other kinds of deaths, the death of a job. Um, you know, for, for a lot of people, that's a real, real concern um, and a reality already for, for many. Um, so we may feel like we are, we are in a tomb right now. Um, but you know, the church, the church waits at the Lord's tomb. And we wait at the Lord's tomb in silence. Um, Holy Saturday, as hopefully those quotes, and I'm, I'm using a lot of language from those quotes um, here, you know, um, in prayer and fasting, which we'll, we'll get to, but we wait at the Lord's tomb. And I don't know how many of you have gone to um, visit tombs and graves. Um, people are generally silent. Um, some people talk while they're there out loud. Um, but it's still kind of a respectful um, tone, um, mostly. And, and some people just sit there in silence and, and talk in their heads, you know, talk to God, pray. Um, you know, some people just go and sit um, or stand. And we don't know what's going through their heads what their or their hearts. Um, but generally, tombs and, and graves are silent places. Um, we're also silent before the mystery of suffering and death. Um, you know, and, and sometimes when we're not silent, there are people who, who wish we would be. Um, I, I know someone um, who um, is, is a funeral director and has said that um, they, they wish that Sometimes people wouldn't talk as much in the reception lines because they say things that aren't, aren't helpful. They're trying to offer comfort or consolation, but um, what they're saying isn't, they're, they're trying to reassure themselves more than they are trying to um, just be with the, the person who, who's in need. Um, we, we have these pithy sayings, these um, platitudes um, that aren't really helpful for a lot of people when they're suffering. God never gives you more than you can handle. Um, that implies that God gave it to them to begin with. And, you know, a lot of times when bad things happen, I think God is just as outraged by it as, as we are. Um, didn't want it to happen, but, you know, free will. God gave us free will. And, God doesn't break our free will. Um, and I think God is justifiably upset um, at, at a lot of things that we do. Um, so saying that God's responsible for, for suffering in, in various ways um, isn't helpful. Um, you know, we, we need to have a, a respect that death and suffering are, are a mystery that we, we don't fully understand. And 
that requires silence to, to sit and um, pause and, and meditate and listen and reflect and kind of appreciate that we're on hallowed ground in a sense, a place where, where God dwells in, in ways that we don't fully understand. And, you know, similarly, we're silent before God's presence. Um, God in the tomb as, as Jesus, suffering, dying, um, breaking into hell, silent before the awesomeness, the even terribleness of God's presence sometimes, um, the, the amount of power um, God has, that if God, you know, we, we have these stories from the Old Testament. Um, of God's anger and power. And those aren't stories that we, we should just dismiss as um, illustrative of, you know, God wanting to save us and, and people just didn't understand how God works. Um, there was an understanding that I think some of us have lost of just how powerful God really is, because we've kind of domesticated God. God loves everyone, which God does. Um, and therefore, God's nice, God's kind, God's gentle, um, and, and God is. Um, but God is also the all-powerful being that created everything, and with a simple thought could have us all dissolve and disappear into nothing, literally nothing, not just like dust and ashes, but non-existence. Um, and we need to be silent before the power of God's presence that, that we face in, in the tomb. Um, one, that God can die, and two, that God can undie, that God can rise from the dead. Um, both are, are kind of miraculous in a way. Um, God becoming human, becoming less than God is, while remaining God, but taking on human nature and, and going through a whole human experience and and dying um, and willingly doing so. Um, that's mind blowing on its own. Um, but then again, the, this whole breaking death, breaking suffering, breaking the power of evil. Um, that it doesn't have any ultimate power. Um, those, are, those are things that we need to appreciate and, and hold in our hearts and be silent before. Um, God's awesome, awesome powerfulness and, and presence. So what do we do? How, how do we use this, this silence? Um, you know, it's essential for encountering and recognizing God, we, we, have, we can't be distracted. Um, we can't be, um, you know, always focusing on different things. We, we need to cultivate silence in our hearts and in our minds to, to allow room for, for us to recognize God and hear, you know, that gentle whisper um, as Elijah did on the on the mountain, not in the tempest or the earthquake or the fire, but in that gentle whisper of the breeze, was God speaking to Elijah. Um, we need to have silence in our hearts and in our minds to to hear how God is speaking to us. So how do we do that? How do we cultivate and practice silence? So here are some brief thoughts on that. One, we wait with Mary. Mary waited at the cross. Um, it doesn't say exactly what she was doing on Holy Saturday, but I'm, I'm sure there was some crying involved. Um, and some praying and some hand wringing and who knows? Who knows what, what Mary was doing on, on Holy Saturday? But we wait with her. Um, again, in silence. And what does Mary do in silence? Mary trusted when the angel came to her, and she pondered all these miraculous events that she witnessed in Jesus's life. What does it say in, in scripture? It says she pondered in her heart. Um, 
And, you know, she accompanied Jesus in his suffering. It's one of the stations of the cross. Jesus meets his mother. Um, you know, and it's always striking um, when I'm carrying one of my children walking in the back of the church um, during Mass, which has become less frequent because Charlotte usually either just needs to be removed from the church <laughs> um, or um, she can sit and be somewhat quiet and um, sort of behaved in the pew. Um, but for, for a little bit, I was able to carry David in the back and he would sometimes point um, at the stations. And, you know, Charlotte, I was able to walk with more. Um, and um, she would always ask, you know, about our station where Mary's crying. Um, that she, you know, she accompanied Jesus in his suffering. And then he, you know, that line from the Gospel of John, um, behold your mother, behold your son. Um, Mary accepted us as her children. So what does that have to do with us? Um, it, it means, one, I think we need to unplug for a chunk of each day and pray. Um, turn off the news, turn off the media, turn off your internet, um, silence your phone, and take some time for silence and pray. Um, and turn off your kids. <laughs> um, that might be the hardest one, turning off your kids. If they're napping, say, this is, this is my chance, I'm, I'm off. If you've got older kids, you know, like, okay, um, they can take care of themselves a little bit more. Um, I'm off all this stuff, I'm gonna pray. Um, if nap time isn't a, a sure thing or doesn't happen um, after they go to bed, um, I know we like to do stuff after they go to bed, like, great, the kids are asleep. Now I can finally, you know, do this or get to that. Hold off for, for a minute. Um, I know we've got a lot of important things to do, but take a little time when you have silence, take it. Um, take it and pray. Um, how else do we do it? We, we be compassionate and accompany others in their suffering. Um, you know, we, we want to walk with people, journey with them. There are people who are, are really um, afraid right now. There are people who are separated from loved ones or spouses because they're not allowed into a hospital or nursing home. Um, there are people, again, who, who've lost their jobs. And some of us may not know what financial insecurity feels like. And someone may be trying to tell us, and we, we may want to skip straight to platitudes or things, just listen, listen and walk with people. Um, you know, I'm here for you. Um, and really be there. Uh, speak so much louder than, you know, saying something because we don't know what to say. Um, we need to accompany others. And I think you know, we need to take advantage of the fact that Mary's our mother, um, you know, and ask her to pray for us. Um, the Pope has already entrusted um, this coronavirus, you know, praying for, for a uh, cure, uh, uh, end of whatever, whatever way works um, to Mary. And I think we need to do that as well. Um, you know, go and say, Mary, you're a mother. Um, pray for us. Um, And I think, you know, similarly, we can listen like St. Joseph. Um, for those of you who, who don't know, Joseph never says anything in scripture. Um, we know what he's thinking um, sometimes, um, where, you know, it says he was considering, you know, what to do when he found out Mary was pregnant. Um, but he never says anything. Um, he listens when angels appear um, and he obeys. And how much simpler would life be if we could all just listen and obey? Listen God and listen to God and obey. Um, like St. Joseph's a great model for how to do this. Um, and of course, you know, uh, again, for, for parents, how much do we wish our kids would just listen and obey? But you know, we might kind of extend that and say, you know, God is our parent and 
maybe he feels the same way about all of us. So again, how does St. Joseph teach us um, to cultivate and practice silence? Um, I think we can listen to God in scripture and in prayer. Um, so if you're taking your silent time, maybe it's a good time to do the daily readings um, or work your way slowly um, a passage at a time through one of the gospels. Um, if you have a little more time, maybe a chapter at a time through one of the gospels. Um, listen for God in the world around us. Um, what's God up to? Um, what are signs of God's presence? Um, and the world around us isn't just the news and the media and big, big events. It's the people in our lives. Um, the excitement we experience anyway. Um, I have a friend who posted um, online their, their um, pregnancy announcement for the Feast of the Annunciation. Um, you know, kind of, a, you know, Catholic nerdy thing to do, someone I know from, you know, studying ministry. Um, but it was really cool. Um, like on the Feast of the Annunciation, we've got this announcement to make. Um, you know, life still goes on, and babies are still miracles, and people falling in love are still miracles. Um, and, you know, celebrating wedding anniversaries and birthdays, um, that there's these joys in life where we're marking occasions and saying, thank you, God, that, you know, my my mother was born, or my sister was born, or um, my friend was born. Um, thank you. How can we pay attention to God in the world around us? Things we talk about with our friends, all of that. Again, ways we can listen, um, practice this silence. And then just, again, this listening patiently to others, this compassion and accompaniment, um, seeking to understand them. What what is on their heart? Um, what are they going through? More so than what do I have to say about it or how can I fix it even? Um, I have a friend who, who used an analogy um, that, you know, I tell you I'm, I'm worried about being fat um, and you tell me how I can figure out if I'm fat or not. Um, or even how to become unfat, that doesn't really attend to my emotional need of, of someone just listening to me and saying, wow, um, I'm sorry, you're, you're really struggling with your, your self-image and your, your understanding of your health or you know, whatever it may be that's hanging on that person from, from that. And that's kind of a, a silly um, example in a sense. Um, you know, we kind of you know, have all these jokes about, does this make me look fat or, you know, all that. But I think it, it also gets across a, a bit of this truth of how can we just listen to people and seek to understand them, where they're at, what's on their heart, before trying to fix it. Because um, a lot of these situations aren't necessarily going to be fixed easily. My wedding's been indefinitely postponed. Wow. Um, I don't know how to fix that even. <laughs> um, and I have a friend in that situation that they don't know when they're getting married anymore. Um, you know, grandpa died and I can't go to the funeral. Um, I'm worried about my parents because they may have been exposed and they both have bad health and they're, they're 75. Um, you know, people just need us to listen sometimes and be like, wow, you know, I can tell you're, you're really stressed about that. You want to, you want to talk some more? You want to, you want to pray with me? Um, how can I, how can I be with you in this? Or is there anything I can do to help? Um, all right, and then um, lastly, and this kind of goes along with that, follow Christ, you know, this obeying, following Christ by caring for others. Um, what I'm not saying is um, 
you know, ignore shelter in place and run around trying to, to try to, you know, do a bunch of things for other people and endanger your health and theirs. But there are ways we can care for others. Um, someone who's quarantined again, you know, they can't go out. How can I get groceries for you and drop them off on your porch? Um, we'll, we'll figure out payment. Um, you know, things like that. Um, you know, who can I call who might be lonely in my family, in my extended friend network? Who, who do I think maybe needs um, to hear from someone? These are things we can do. So again, we're, we're waiting at the Lord's tomb on Holy Saturday, and we're waiting, you know, at a tomb right now. Um, so I want to talk about this being a, a different kind of vigil, um, not the vigil of Holy Saturday necessarily. Um, I have an experience of doing a vigil um, several times, um, more than several, I don't know how many, um, with uh, weather amnesty when I was up in South Bend. Um, I actually was part of the, the group that started get this, getting this program going right after college um, when I was on staff at the Catholic Worker. Um, we just started getting it going um, in the spring and, and summer before I left um, to go um, and actually helped start up a Catholic Worker newspaper and, and the beginnings of a community um, in Hawaii, a newspaper might be um, digital, um, virtual paper might, is, is a better description, but helped get a, a community started up there that now has a house, which is exciting. Um, but, um, you know, we, we just started talking about this program and I'd helped um, in some of the, the meetings and preparations for, for that. And then I came back in the program, it was nice to see the program was up and running when I came back two years later. Um, and I volunteered regularly as a host for Weather Amnesty where, you know, during the winter months, um, we would offer in the Catholic Workers Drop-In Center, which wasn't a, a residential center, but had been given an exception along with some other places by the city of South Bend to do um, temporary shelter in the winter for people who needed places to sleep, who were homeless and wouldn't have a place to sleep otherwise in the cold. Um, so we would take in 10 men on beds um, every night in this um, kind of, what was generally the donation drop-off room. It wasn't like a, a glorified place, but there were beds and there was a desk for the host to sit at overnight. And we'd have two or three hosts each night so you could rotate. You didn't get a full night's sleep, but you got some sleep. And you'd sit at the desk and have a little candle lit and you could pray, you could read, um, I would pray and read and journal. And um, I reflected, I think I was hosting either um, Holy Thursday night or, or Good Friday night um, one year, um, kind of towards the, the tail end of weather amnesty, but it stays colder in, in South Bend longer than, than here. Um, and Easter may have been a little earlier that year. But I was there and I was reflecting on um, the situation of all these men coming and sleeping who don't have a home anywhere else. Um, and, you know, the resurrection and new life and the kingdom of God that Jesus came to bring that we already have in the sense that, you know, um, the power of sin and death has been broken and the kingdom is kind of, we believe God is working to, you know, bring the kingdom forth in, in, in our world. Um, but it's not fully here yet. Um, as St. Paul says already, but not yet. Um, we live in this kind of liminal space. We're living on the edge of, um, this transition, um, this breaking out of the, the full power of the resurrection is it, it keeps kind of trying to pop forth and bloom in, in little and in big ways in our world. Um, I was reflecting on all of that and on how, in a sense, we're, we're kind of like living Holy Saturday in our world all the time that 
Christ has already um, broken the power of sin and death. Um, you know, he, he's doing combat in hell. And again, it's not like combat, like he's dueling with Satan. He's just, you know, um, like, hey, we're going to break out of here because I'm God and it can't, can't stop me. Um, <laughs> and, um, but we, we haven't seen all of the fruits of that yet. Um, there's still suffering in the world. There's still pain. There's death. There's injustice. Um, all of these things. And so I was reflecting on that. And I think that's the kind of vigil we're keeping now that, you know, a lot of us live pretty comfortable lives. Um, we're in the first world and, you know, even when we have struggles, they're usually not of the life or death variety. Um, you know, our, it's not to minimize certain kinds of um, psychological and emotional suffering, which can be very deep for, for people. But in the realm of like our, our mortality, our, our physical, um, you know, there are people with chronic diseases um, and chronic suffering and, and things like that. But most of us are, we're not faced with um, the prospect of not having health care when we need it. Um, not even having an adequate infrastructure for, for general health care, let alone a, a, an epidemic when we need it. We're not faced with the prospect of starvation. Um, and there, there are people in our society who are malnourished. Um, and there are some who live on that, that boundary of food insecurity. Um, we, we don't hear a lot about people dying from starvation. Um, you know, we're, we're not in Syria right now where, where people are being bombed um, or other places where war is going on um, or uprisings. Um, so I think in, in some sense where it's maybe more obvious to, to people in other situations, this sense of um, God's kingdom already coming forth but not yet being here um, this might be a, a calling for us to reflect more deeply on that, that um, this is a, a way for us to attach more to um, that sense of vigil and longing for, for the full kingdom. Um, and then um, also, what happens at the tomb in the Gospels? I think that's something that can be instructive for us to think about. Um, and someone we maybe don't think about what happens to them at the tomb in the Gospels are the guards. Um, they're shaken with fear, and they're like dead men. And hopefully we're not like them. Um, you know, we can, we can be afraid, um, but we can't let it paralyze us, and we can't let it conquer us. As um, St. John says in one of his letters, perfect love casts out fear, um, which would seem to mean that to the extent we let fear rule us, we aren't able to fully love. Um, so it's okay to be afraid and to acknowledge that you're afraid, but we can't let it rule us. Um, we can't become like dead men. Um, the counterexample is the women who were fearful, yet overjoyed. They were fearful, um, but they were also overjoyed. And they went and they proclaimed the resurrection. Um, Mary Magdalene, the apostle to the apostles. Um, you know, they're given instructions by the angels and, and Mary Magdalene by Jesus himself. Go, tell them, tell them. Jesus is risen. Go, do it, tell them. And they do it. Um, and they're afraid. They're terrified. Like, what does this mean? But at the same time, if, if you're told this person you've devoted your life to, that you put so much hope in, had risen from the dead, wouldn't you be overjoyed? Um, and then Peter and John, they're amazed. It says they were amazed and they believed, but they did not yet understand. And we don't yet understand. We can be amazed. And we can believe. 
and we can say we don't yet understand. We don't know why this is happening. We don't know what God is doing in all of this, but we trust that in every bad situation, God can bring a greater good out of it. Um, like the murder of his only son um, <laughs> becomes the salvation of the entire world, the enslavement of um, a child. Um, Joseph being sold into slavery by his brothers becomes the means by which God keeps the known world at that time for, you know, the biblical people, you know, Egypt and um, Mesopotamia, um, the land of Canaan, uh, keeps them from starvation, that people are coming to Egypt for grain because God used Joseph to say we need to store up grain. Um, you know, it's okay for us in the midst of a, a crisis to say we don't understand. We don't. Um, but we're, we're still amazed at the power of God, and we still believe. So reflection question, how do you respond to the tomb? Um, and I'm not going to pause and leave a bunch of silence here. Um, you can pause it. It's a recording. Um, but take a little time. How do you respond to the tomb? What is your response to the tomb? Jesus' tomb, the prospect of your own tomb, the tomb we're looking at right now, all of them, how do you respond to the tomb? So pause, think, when you're ready, hit play, and we'll continue. Then it says in prayer and fasting, um, we, we celebrate Holy Saturday in prayer and fasting. We wait at the tomb in prayer and fasting. And I want to talk about us being in a state of prayer and fasting right now. Excuse me. Being in a state of prayer and fasting right now. Um, as an ongoing discipline, something we, we practice daily, habitually. Um, we, we pray and fast and supplication before the Lord. Um, so what does that mean for prayer? Um, Obviously, we, we pray for coronavirus, um, and I'll show you that prayer on the website in just a second. And for all the suffering throughout the world, again, we, we can't forget that there's other suffering going on. We can't be consumed by our own situation so much that we forget that there's still war, there's still violence. There, even in our own country, there's other forms of suffering. People, unfortunately, I'm sure, are still getting divorces. Um, people are still having their hearts broken. Um, people are dying from other things, and people are still unable to be with loved ones who are, who are sick from something else. Um, you know, there, there are people who are victims of abuse, verbal, physical, psychological, um, and those are problems throughout the world, um, but that's not even getting into, you know, physical suffering, except for the, the abuse and sickness and death. But, you know, other forms, you know, living in, in the fear of violence in a, in a war-torn country, living amidst, um, you know, famine or the prospect of famine, um, not having enough food, being now malnourished and possibly starving, um, being in a country with high child mortality rates. Um, lack of adequate medical care, um, all these things. Um, and, and I'm sure plenty of other things, I'm just going off the top of my head here, that there, there's so many ways that there's suffering around the world. We, we need to pray about that. And again, we, we can't be consumed by our own situation so much that we forget the needs of others. Because um, that then becomes kind of a form of self-absorption or self-centeredness. Um, and what our suffering should do is allow us to connect to the needs of others, to empathize more, um, not to come in and, and isolate in ourselves and you know pity ourselves and our situation, but to, to see others even more clearly, and to appreciate even more clearly the pain and, and difficulty that others are in. Um, so before we go on um, to the next one, I'm gonna um, show you our website in case you don't know where this um, prayer for the coronavirus is. Um, so if you go to our homepage, um, and, you know, we've got the tabs up at the top, home and coronavirus, 
um, which hopefully won't be on our website for too much longer of a time. Um, but if you click on that, um, we've got some updates, uh, which is just good general information for you if you haven't been visiting our, our website. But if you haven't, then you probably wouldn't be accessing this talk or you maybe you got on Facebook, but, um, and then on our website, um, and this is where the act of spiritual communion is that I'll reference later, but a prayer during the time of coronavirus, you can click here and find a prayer that um, takes a few minutes to pray, but it, it's very thorough and I think very well written. Um, and you can download that onto any device that you want. You can print it out, I'm sure, you know, to have it to, to pray with. Um, so that's, that's something you can do. Um, so we'll, we'll go back to my uh, presentation now. Um, there we go. And then fasting. What can we do with fasting? Um, so one, our sufferings, as I mentioned, and, and this whole situation, hopefully are, are helping us connect more, um, be more compassionate. Um, but fasting can connect us to the sufferings of Christ who takes on all our sufferings, any, any suffering we're going through um, voluntarily or involuntarily can connect us to Christ. And then by, by doing that can become redemptive for others. Um, as, as Paul says, making up in his body what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. And the church is very clear in saying what that doesn't mean is that there is something lacking in the, the sufferings of Christ that is needed for, for redemption. But what it's saying is that um, Christ takes upon himself all our suffering. And to the extent we, we join our sufferings to Christ, um, that we approach Christ in our sufferings, um, unite ourselves to Christ in our sufferings. Christ is able to use those sufferings more for the benefit of others. Um, they can be taken up into his cross and resurrection. They can go into the tomb and, and burst forth into new life as well. Um, so fasting, what can we do to fast? Um, and Lent is a time of fasting already, but maybe we need to consider something more than just giving up chocolate or, or Facebook. Um, and if you've given up social media, maybe... Um, you know, for the sake of being able to connect more with people, taking on a little social social media, or at least calling people a lot more is, is a good thing to do, given our current situation. Um, if you really need to, to, you know, cure yourself of the technology addiction, then, then please continue doing that. Um, but, um, you know, how, how can we really take on, on fasting? Um, give up a meal once a week, give up a meal once a day, give up all our snacks, um, you know, take, take sufferings we're already going through maybe. Um, maybe you have had your heart broken recently or some terrible tragedies befallen you. Um, you know, maybe you're one of these people who separated from a loved one. Um, approach Christ in that suffering and talk to him about it and, and connect to Christ's passion. Unite yourself and offer what you're going through um, for the sake of others. Um, for those who, who have even less or, or who are in particular need of consolation. Um, it can be as simple as saying Christ what I'm going through right now really sucks. And I hope that you can use that um, not only to help me in my life as I continue to grow as your disciple, but to help other people. Somehow, some way, I don't even need to know how you do it or, or to understand how it happens, but please use this to make things better for, for me or, or someone else, um, particularly people who, who are in need of, of those graces right now. Uh, doesn't have to be a complicated prayer. Doesn't even have to be as complicated as what I said. Um, you know, yeah, I I offer this meal I'm skipping for those who don't have enough. Um, 
I don't know how it'll help them, but I trust that somehow through your passion, death and resurrection, that, that the fasting I'm voluntarily taking on can in some way make a difference for those who have to involuntarily um, skip out on food, um, who need more. So a word on praying from our homes. Um, set up a special area um, for personal or, you know, if you're, you're a family household, um, for family prayer. Um, this is a picture of the table we, we set up. Um, we have a um, purple tablecloth that I bought um, in Guatemala while visiting our sister parish. Um, and uh, we set it up. Um, with um, the Mary and Joseph figurines from our um, one of our nativity sets, um, and the kids regularly come in and, and play with with the figurines and sometimes add the the wise men to our our prayer table um, and um, a freestanding crucifix you know if you don't have a freestanding one, you can lay one down on the table or, or find a way to prop it up. Um, but that's uh, actually a piece I inherited from my great aunt. Um, so it's, it's very old. Um, and I was glad I had it. I was like, wow, this would be perfect for our prayer table. Um, so set up a space for, for prayer. Um, and make it a special place. Sacred means set apart. Um, set apart for particular use. For the, the use of worship. For liturgy. For prayer. For God. Um, so only use it for prayer and for watching mass. Um, you know, we've been trying to, to limit our, our children from turning this area into a play area. It's in a, a room we don't use a lot in our house. It's outside the baby gates. Um, it's our, our front room. Um, and, you know, we, we thought it would be the, the best spot. Um, for, for family. There's a, a couch there, a wraparound couch, so we can kind of sit um, around the prayer table. Um, but help, help your family know this is a special place um, and pray there on your own. Help them see this is a place for prayer. You don't have to talk aloud as you're praying, um, but just if you're going to go and pray, read some scripture, use your unplugged time, go there, do that. Um, and do things that engage your children in the prayer. Um, you know, you can see we have our children's Bible out. You know, we, we sit there and we read, you know, children's Bible stories to, to our kids when we're around there for prayer. Um, it's, it's not all adult prayer all the time or, or anything like that. We, we try to pray with them on their level there too. Um, you know, if, if you don't have young children, feel free to put out a real candle. If you have young children, um, if you have electronic candles, those might be safer. <laughs> um, and then, you know, as I mentioned, we have our nativity figurines. Um, but, you know, maybe you have something else you can put out there, a um, piece of um, religious art. Um, you know, what works for you, for your family, um, for, for the prayer table. Um, and then... Kind of last of all, um, make sure you have a Franciscan mentality with all of this for, for those of you with pets, because um, you'll need it. <laughs> um, this is our cat Simba, and he chose the um, very second that I was um, taking a picture for this presentation um, to hop up on the table. Um, so I had to chew him off to, to get the <laughs> other picture, or I don't remember which one I took first. Um, but yeah, he, he just jumped up on the table, and I'm sure they've been on the table at other times. Um, but yeah, um, have a Franciscan mentality. <laughs> um, so a little more on praying from our homes, praying with scripture. Um, some suggestions for, for people. I already mentioned maybe just working your way through a gospel um, or doing the daily readings. If you want some readings that maybe have more to do with this theme of the tomb, um, there's story of Jairus's daughter, Jesus raising Jairus's daughter um, from the dead. Um, and that's in um, Mark, Matthew, and Luke. Um, and those are the scripture notations. Again, since you can pause this, I'm not going to, um, you know, give you time to, you know, make notes. You can pause and make your notes or take screenshots or whatever. There's also the story of the son of the widow of Nain. Um, and um, that's only in the Gospel of Luke. 
And then there's the raising of Lazarus, which is our, our gospel for this weekend. Um, and by the time this gets posted, maybe it will have been the gospel for this past weekend. I don't know. Um, but the raising of Lazarus from, from the dead, um, which is in the gospel of John. Um, so those are our three options of praying with this theme of um, resurrection, um, in addition to, of course, the actual resurrection stories. Um, but Jesus giving the gift of life, if you want to pray um, around that theme. And then um, how we care for others, how we recognize Christ in our, our lives. Um, the um, separation of the sheep from the goats, the, you know, that which you did unto the least of these is that which you did unto me. That's Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Um, so that's another option for, for praying with. And, and meditating on how, how can I do some of these things in a creative way where I'm not supposed to be going out a whole lot. Um, not hoarding things, but maybe bulk buying certain things and, and donating some of those. Um, um, you know, that, that would be one option. Um, writing letters, making extra phone calls, um, things like that. Um, but you can meditate on that and think about some of the ways you might be able to do some of those things. And then connecting with Christ's passion and death. Um, how can we connect with Christ's passion and death? Um, which is that part, you know, where it says we're, we're meditating on his passion and death and descent into hell on Holy Saturday. How do we do that? Um, Stations of the Cross, again, on the website. Um, I'll show you exactly where those are. Um, chances are, if you're watching this on the website, you already know. But um, you know, here, this, you should be seeing a picture of our website again. Um, so there are actually several places. Right now, they're on the front page. I don't know if they're only there because this is Friday. They might be gone tomorrow. Um, if you go to Liturgy, and you go over to Stations of the Cross under the Liturgy tab, um, they will be there as well um, for you to, to watch. Um, and we filmed this um, with our stations, um, Deacon John Gomez um, leading the Stations of the Cross. Um, it's got music, it's, um, you know, I, I think very well done. Um, so, um, feel free to, to, you know, take advantage of that. You can put it on your computer, on your family prayer table, and your whole family can, can pray the Stations of the Cross. You can even make room around the prayer table to kneel every time we, we kneel for each station. Um, you know, so you can, you can do the Stations of the Cross as a family with this. Um, so again, that's, that's there as a, a resource. All right, so back to my presentation here. Um, Stations of the Cross, you can also search online. I think Bishop Barron has some online. Um, and then um, Catholic Release Services has um, a Stations of the Cross that, that people can, can look at as well. And Bishop Barron's featured in the Catholic Release Services one. And I'm sure, you know, if you search, you'll find lots of, you know, Stations of the Cross examples online. Um, but, you know, the ones in our, our parish are, are very well done. Um, you can read the Passion in Scripture. Um, it's in all four Gospels in, in you know, various ways. Um, you can look up and, and read through the Passion in one sitting. Um, you know, in, in a couple sittings, you can spread it out, you know, a kind of a section of the Passion at a time. Um, you know, you can, you can do that. That's another way of meditating, especially if you do it slowly and and reflect on it, um, or you go back over it, you know, over the course of a few days, you read it, um, read it again, read it again, descend into um, the story. Um, and you can even place yourself in the story if you want. You can make yourself, you know, imagine you're one of the disciples who runs away, or even Peter who, who follows and, and then betrays Jesus. Um, you can put yourself in the story as Jesus. Um, what would it be like if I were Jesus going through all of this? Um, just as an observer who, you know, try to imagine it happening as you, you picture it. Um, so that's a, another way to read it. Um, you can pray the Sorrowful Mysteries of the Rosary. Um, it's one of my favorite ways to reflect on the Passion. 
Um, and um, I think I, I think it was for longer than just Holy Week. Um, but when I was living in Hawaii, um, I um, walked to work and walked home three miles each way. So I got a six mile walk every day, uh, Monday through Friday, um, which is great. And it was always beautiful weather. Um, and um, during Lent, I don't think it was all of Lent, but a significant portion, I remember especially, um, you know, doing it during Holy Week, I would, I would pray the rosary, um, sometimes both on my way there and on my way back, um, you know, during my walk, um, you know, and I'd still have plenty of time left over, you know, because it only takes about 15 or 20 minutes to pray the rosary, which is about how long it takes to walk a mile. So I had about double that time left over. Um, and, you know, I would reflect on the sorrowful mysteries. Um, and it's a, a great way to meditate on Christ's passion and death. Um, and again, to, to do it with Mary. And then that um, homily that I, I showed you the, um, for Holy Saturday, it's on this presentation. You can pause, you can take screenshots, you can, you know, go back and kind of fast forward to it and, and meditate on just that part of it. Um, you know, that's a great resource for reflecting on Christ's descent into hell. and really the, the power of his descent into hell um, to help give us hope that maybe we, we need in this time. So another reflection question for you. Um, how are you connecting to Christ right now in, in this situation? What are you doing? How is it going? Um, how are you connecting to Christ? So again, you know, take some time, pause, reflect, um, literally pause the the presentation here and reflect and then um, you can go back to, to listening when you're done. And then this uh, No Eucharist, um, which I used to um, as a title for, for two different parts of the Holy Saturday, uh, where it says we, we abstain from the sacrifice of the Mass until after the solemn vigil and Holy Communion is only for those in need of viaticum. Um, and you know, again, um, the situation is a little different in that we can't attend, but Mass is still happening and being offered for us. In fact, in this diocese, I don't know about other dioceses, but in this diocese, the bishop has mandated that every Mass that a priest says in private has to be offered for the people, um, for us who, who aren't able to attend Mass. Um, and of course, if you have a Mass intention that's supposed to be said during this time, um, he's also mandated that those be rescheduled for as most of it, you know, soon as a convenient time as possible. Um, but, um, you know, we can't attend, but Mass is still happening. So unlike Holy Saturday, where it says, you know, we abstain from the sacrifice of the Mass as a whole church, um, we are, in a sense, abstaining. Um, we can't attend Mass, and we can, you know, through the, you know, gifts of modern technology, using it well, we can watch Mass. Um, if you wanted, you could watch Mass 24 hours a day. Um, I'm sure there's enough Masses recorded on the internet, especially now, for, for you to do that. But you watch the same Mass over and over. Um, I'm being a little, I'm being a lot facetious, actually, um, for this. But um, I think it's calling us to a, a connection, to, to realize that we are still united to the Eucharist as members of the body of Christ. Um, to rely more heavily on our sense of the mystical body of Christ as the church, that even though we can't be there, and this is good for, for people who are sick and, and can't attend Mass anyway. If you're sick and can't attend Mass, even when Mass is happening, if you have a family member or friend who's um, bedridden um, due to illness or, or infirmity or, or disease, um, whether, you know, it's they're, they're having to stay at home, they can't get out, they're in a nursing home, they're in the hospital. Um, you can tell them they're still united to the Eucharist as members of the body of Christ. Um, I can't remember the exact quote, but as St. Augustine says something like um, uh, about the Eucharist, receive what you are and be what you receive. 
um, become what you receive. Um, that we are the body of Christ and the Eucharist is the body of Christ. And yet we aren't fully the body of Christ because we're not completely living as Christ. Um, and so the Eucharist helps us become the body of Christ. Um, but if we really kind of play, no, like we are united to Christ. We're, you know, again, in the tomb, we are baptized into his death and resurrection. That's not just pretty language. We believe that we are connected to his death and resurrection. We enter the tomb with him and we leave the tomb in resurrected life with him through baptism. We are given that life. Um, we become members of Christ um, through baptism and continue to have it kind of re-upped in us, um, continue to be initiated um, into his body through the Eucharist every time we receive it. Um, so that's, that's something beautiful that I think we can still remember that even though we can't receive the Eucharist right now, we can't go to adoration right now, um, we are still united to Christ um, in the Eucharist, in the body of Christ, um, as his members. Um, as it talked about in that reading, that the angels would worship us as God. Um, doesn't mean we're becoming gods. It means that we're in Christ, and the angels are worshiping Christ and because we are in him and he is in us. We are truly part of his body. And so when the angels worship Christ, they are worshiping us because we are that tied to him, that we are in him. Um, so we are united to Christ. Um, so I mentioned earlier on that coronavirus page, I showed you it's right by that uh, coronavirus prayer, um, spiritual communion, um, how to make an act of spiritual communion. So if you're particularly longing for the Eucharist, and of course, you know, we, we have an opportunity for this um, during our, um, you know, live stream of the Mass as well. Um, but you can pray the, the act of spiritual communion on your own outside of the context of Mass, um, about desiring union with Christ, that he dwell in you, um, that you long for him in the Eucharist, but... Um, because you can't receive him, you can still pray this prayer and say, I, I want you to come dwell in me. Um, so that's, that's a tradition in our church that's a little less or, or a lot less common now than it, than it used to be, but it's something good that we can also remember, um, that we have these resources from our tradition. And I think it also calls us to pray again for, for the sick, infirm and dying, people who are deceased um, and those who are separated from them or that, that they are separated from. Um, you know, that this separation um, and this need for those who may need viaticum um, and, and those who are just separated from loved ones, we're separated from Christ who we long for, people who are separated from, from those that they long for. We should be praying for them. Um, and praying for those who, who are facing death in, in, a, in a literal way. Um, and then, again, we can pray for people who are lonely, afraid, people who are at risk, um, who, who, as far as we know, aren't, aren't ill, but pray that they don't get ill, pray that they don't get exposed, pray for their comfort and consolation, um, pray that, um, you know, we be able to help them in their time of need. And those who are lonely and afraid, we can pray for them. And, and if you know someone who's lonely and afraid, please reach out as well. Um, but we should also pray for them, hold them in our hearts, and bring them, bring them to Christ's heart. They're already there, but come and, and bring that intention to Christ's heart and say, Christ, um, I'm bringing this person to you. Um, please be with them and, and help me to know the ways that you are with them and the ways that I can be your presence for them. And then our longing, we can offer our longing, our suffering that, that we experience in our longing for Christ. We can offer that for, for people who are spiritually bereft, those, those who don't know their own spiritual longing, who, who don't, don't have spiritual connection or, or, 
you know, don't even recognize their longing for God or, or know that they're longing for something, they're missing something, but they don't know what it is. We can offer our longing as a way of saying, God, help this suffering that I'm, I, that I'm experiencing in my absence from you to help those who are absent from you in other ways. Um, so that, that's another way that we can um, approach this situation of not having access to the Eucharist. And then awaiting his resurrection. Um, how do we await the resurrection of Christ? Which, you know, again, this is talking about specifically the, the vigil, um, the Easter vigil mass, which is the anticipation by night of the resurrection when the time comes for paschal joys, the abundance of which overflows to occupy 50 days, um, the Easter season, 50 days, which is longer than Lent. Um, we celebrate for longer than we prepare. It's very important. Um, because I think a lot of us kind of skip out on the celebrating, get back to life as is, and, and we need to cultivate the celebration. Um, the abundance of the resurrection, the paschal joy, the abundance of this joy of, of the resurrection and the fruits we should be getting should overflow to occupy 50 days of celebrating. 50 days of celebrating. Um, wow. <laughs> like the church tells us to party for 50 days. Um, <laughs> Like, we should be doing that. Um, and, and we should be taking the, the joy of the resurrection with that amount of seriousness. Like, if you gave your kids a 50-day pass to party, you'd be terrified of what they would do. Of course, we're supposed to party as disciples, so, you know, we're, we're not going to be, you know, getting drunk and doing drugs and um, all that stuff. Um, but to cultivate joy, to find reasons for um, doing fun, good, enjoyable things, embracing life, um, getting together and having cookouts and barbecues and, and um, social gatherings and, and all of it, you know, find, find ways to celebrate in your life. Find ways to celebrate the resurrection. Um, the abundance of which overflows to occupy 50 days. I love that line. I, I hope I never forget it. I hope none of you ever forget it. So here we are at the tomb awaiting his resurrection, um, anticipating this joy, which, you know, in one sense, we're all, we're all waiting to get out of our homes to, to be able to go back to, to doing things. But not go back to just normal, at least not for, for a lot of us, where just normal is rushing around with too much. Um, how do we take our quantity um, that we feel bombarded by a lot in our life, by so much stuff, how can we take that quantity and turn it into quality? when we can leave the tomb of our homes, the tomb of this virus, the tomb of the, this whole situation um, of panic and fear and uh, death, literal and, and figurative and metaphorical and, and financial and everything else. And how do, we, how do we leave and bring the abundance of these fruits and bring them to people who who may still be mourning in different ways, who aren't going to get jobs back right away. How can we do all of that um, and do quality, quality um, when we get out of the tomb um, that overflows? Um, so as we await all this, as we anticipate, um, ask Jesus to show you how he's at work in the world. Ask. You may not get an answer right away. You may just get more confused. Um, but ask, because eventually, on God's timeline, we will know. We will see. Ask God to show you how he is at work in the world. Um, you may not get the full picture, but you may get a snippet here and there. Enough to, to help you get along. Um, and to share consolation with others. Um, 
And then kind of a corollary to that, look for how the body of Christ is bringing light to the darkness. Um, how is the church, um, not just in televised prayer services and, and masses and um, benedictions and blessings, which are all great and amazing, and um, you know, we, we should tap into those resources, but how is the church as the people of God bringing light to the darkness? And how can we tap into that? How can we be a part of that in individual people's lives, in the virtual world, which is even more important than ever right now and um, full of new people, in a sense, who don't necessarily spend a lot of time, but maybe now for the first time are really getting engaged in technology to, to connect and how can we help people connect to say, hey, this is how you use that function on your phone um, or on your computer um, so we can see each other now um, when we talk instead of just talking um, over the phone, but let's see each other while we talk because even that helps make a difference. Um, so how can, how can we look for the ways that the body of Christ is bringing light to the darkness? And let your Christian joy overflow. Um, trust that ultimately nothing can harm us if we are in Christ. Um, death is not the end. Um, quite literally, death is not the end um, for the resurrection. But um, these other deaths we can experience, they're also not the end. Um, they may be the end of a part of our life, maybe a part of our life for a while. Um, but where there is death in Christ, there's always new life. Um, may not be the new life we're looking for or that we want, um, but Christ will be leading us. And we need to have that trust, that trust that Mary had. We need to ponder, we need to reflect, we need to see these things in silence and prayer. And we need to let our joy overflow, even in the midst of our suffering, um, and bring that to others. Uh, people are looking for meaning. And that doesn't mean you have to be able to give them a theological explanation of how all this may be in line with God's plan, or, or maybe this is what God's trying to do, don't, don't try to do that. Um, you don't need to do that. You can just witness to how the resurrection gives you joy, how Christ gives you joy, um, that you can move beyond what this means for you and pray for others, care for others, or that you've been cared for by others, and you're so thankful to God for that. Um, let our joy overflow. Um, we're in the tomb, but let's break it. Break it with our joy. Um, wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> so another reflection question. How do you live the resurrection? How do you live the resurrection in your life? How are you doing it now? How have you been doing it? How are you doing with it at this moment? Um, any or all of those, again, you can pause, um, think about it, and then um, join back um, for the remainder of this presentation, which is almost over, I promise you. Um, so final thoughts here. Just as we all pass through the tomb with Christ into new life, this too shall pass as we await the day when we gather again. Um, obviously the picture suggests gathering again for mass and the Eucharist gathering as our local expression, our local, um, you know, setting as, as the body of Christ, um, gathering, you know, as a parish, as a community, but, you know, gathering again in each other's homes backyards, schoolyards, playgrounds. I can't take my kids to a playground. I put them in a stroller and went for a jog. And normally when we go in the stroller, 
they're going to a playground. And that was the first question. Daddy, we go to the playground? Especially when my jogging route took us near some familiar landmarks. It's like, I'm sorry, we can't go to the playground right now. It's closed. You could, you could get sick there. Gathering at all these places. Um, baseball games, go cards. Hockey games, go blues. Um, you know, when we can just gather, that, that'll be a relief. Um, so when we can gather again. And then ultimately, for those who, who do pass with Christ into, into new life, um, into the life of the resurrection, we, we await the day when we gather again in heaven. Um, that is our reality, our faith, our belief, that we await that day just as much as, and, and even more so than the day we can just gather at the, at the county park or the city park or, or the church parking lot or the church itself or a neighbor's home or talk over the backyard fence without staying six feet away, shake people's hands. Um, you know, that day will come and we should be ready to celebrate it with the abundance of 50 days. Um, <laughs> So that, I, I think, unless I have a, a slide between this and, and my last slide, but um, that I think is our, our, last, um, our last slide, my closing thought here. Um, so I thank you all for, for listening to all this. I have no idea how long this was. I'm sure it was over my normal amount of time because it felt like it. Um, so maybe watch this in pieces. Um, I should go back and have that put in the comments at the in the description of this um because it's no help to you now <laughs> um but for those of you who, who made it through either in pieces or in whole thank you very much hopefully this has been helpful for you um for your household your family if if you have one if you're a single person um maybe more so in the sense that you don't have other people in your homes um that maybe you're even lonelier. Um, so, um, and maybe you're not, maybe you're an introvert and this is like great personal introvert time and you are very happy right now. But thank you for watching this. I, again, I hope it's been helpful. And please know that I'm praying for all of you. Um, I pray for all of our parishioners daily. Um, and if you've asked me to pray for a particular intention, that's also on my prayer lists. Uh, if you have one that you'd like to send me to pray for, I, I'd be happy to pray for that as well. Um, but I, I do have something to kind of end that I thought you might enjoy, kind of ties into all of this. Um, so our final slide is just um, a little bit of humor for, for all of you. For sale, single owner tomb, only used three days and still has that new tomb smell. Reason for sale, resident was resurrected. Amen. All right. Thank you all very much. Um, I'm glad that you were able to participate in this with me. And I look forward to um, seeing you all in person, hopefully sooner rather than later. So God bless you all.